uh, I'll uh, repeat uh, the announcement for dinner because uh, I was told that uh, there is another place called Zimmerman, but you should look for Weinhof Zimmerman, which is written on this paper. So don't get confused. And if there is any confusion, please ask us. Otherwise, you will end up in a different place. And yeah, then there won't be a conference dinner there. So. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so let's go ahead. We continue with quantum sensing. And uh, uh, we have discussed the application of error correction for improving sensitivity. So we here again see the results. So it's uh, you recover the sensitivity of our quantum sensor in the presence of noise. And uh, to conclude this topic, I would like to um, highlight what you can do with a quantum error correction and what you cannot do with uh, dynamical decoupling. So think about having an atom uh, with uh, excited state uh, and a ground state. And uh, so you, if you want to correct the spontaneous decay, I think that was a bit of topic of discussion before. Um, if you want to um, uh, correct it using dynamical decoupling, you have to drive the atom uh, with the frequencies that are exceeding optical frequencies, frequencies of vacuum photons. So that's not possible. But uh, if you want to correct it with uh, error correction and freeze the atom in excited state, um, you uh, need to drive much faster than uh, decay rate. And uh, for atom with nanoseconds uh, time scale of excited state decay, it's gigahertz or maybe even tens of megahertz. So that's something that you potentially can do. Um, so you can modify uh, even spontaneous decay in a system. Uh, and that's something which is very hard to do with uh, uh, conventional dynamical decoupling. Uh, applications of in V centers to sensing. Uh, Actually, uh, T1 time of NV center, which is on a millisecond time scale, is given by interaction with phonons uh, and not direct interaction between spin levels, but a Raman type process. Uh, so, if you want to um, basically freeze these dynamics, if you want to do it with dynamical decoupling technique, you need to drive it uh, faster than very high frequency phonons in diamond. Uh, and in case of quantum error correction, uh, protection, you need to drive faster than decay, and so faster than uh, the millisecond. So it can be also another interesting application. It's still a long way before this uh, protection get better than, uh, than you know, conventional dynamical decoupling. You need very precise gates, and there is some overheads in making these gates, but uh, it can fight high frequency noise that is not possible to uh, fight with uh, dynamical decoupling. So it's complementary. In addition, quantum error correction uh, can be combined into with dynamical decoupling. You can still run your echoes and behind it do sometimes error correction steps. <clears throat> so in this, it's uh, also maybe one of the cases where a small scale quantum computer reach uh, quantum supremacy. You know, with three qubits, you cannot beat a classical computer. And with five qubits, neither. Uh, but applying quantum error correction on the sensor allow you to beat any, you know, uh, classical technique and improving the sensor because you can do it better than any classical techniques. So it's a kind of interesting application of a very small scale quantum computer. All right. Um, so now I would like to, uh, again, compare uh, uh, spectra of nanoscale NMR and uh, uh, normal NMR signal. We have discussed it, this already uh, in terms of uh, um, fluctuations and signals. Uh, and uh, there is a big difference between nanoscale NMR and uh, uh, stochastic polarization uh, and uh, conventional NMR. In this nanoscale uh, settings, your signals uh, actually is kind of a square root of n uh, scaling and uh, the polarization itself uh, decreases with larger number of spins. Um, 
for conventional polarization, polar, uh, conventional NMR polarization is a constant value given by the uh, magnetic field and the temperature. Uh, and uh, the signal increases uh, with a number of spins linearly, as we discussed. And at some point, it even gets larger than this uh, mesoscopic scale sightings. But there is also different signal itself. In a conventional NMR, you apply a pi half pulse of nuclear spin and you get a precession of nuclear spins. And the Fourier tar transform of this gives you this very well resolved spectra. <clears throat> and uh, all the molecules are in a detection volume. So they all process in phase. And you can get very long uh, acquisition time, very high spectral resolution. For nanoscale NMR, where molecules diffuse in and out from the sensing volume, uh, they are coming with a different phase, kind of. And uh, in this case, you will get a phase fluctuation, amplitude and phase fluctuations on a time scale of the diffusion. And if your volume is a nanosecond, so diffusion can be fast. And that's a limitation in the uh, resolving power. So you can have very good detector with a millihertz spectral resolution, but the signal itself is having very fast, uncontrollable modulation, and that lead to the very broad uh, line width. Um, so actually, that seems to be very um, dramatic uh, uh, for nanoscale NMR, but there are some features in the spectrum that uh, um, actually might help you. So this uh, mesoscopic and nanoscale NMR is a new field, and we started to look what you expect uh, from the spectral shape uh, in this setting. So if you now have uh, molecules diffusing on top of NV center, and they signal actually decays as a dipole-dipole coupling, uh, as a distance power three, uh, you can analyze the signal that NV center C when the molecule goes through, uh, and it actually it turns out that the signal the spectral shape is not Lorentzian. So it's not having a flat top. And having a flat top are very bad for the spectral uh, resolving power. Because when two lines are getting very close, you cannot resolve any more minimum between two spectral components. That's where your, um, your information about spectral composition of the signal goes to uh, zero. And it's because of this particular uh, nature of interaction. It's not the photons that are emitted by molecules and, and get absorbed by NV center. It's a dipole-dipole interaction that is detected. And this interaction do have a third power dependence on the distance. Uh, the line shape is affected by the nature of the interaction. And the spectrum that uh, NV center C is actually having a sharp peak. It's not Lorentzian. So if you have now uh, this in a time domain, you can see a difference between a kind of exponential decay if your atom emits and you, you, you detect this photon, so it's exponential decay and it's Lorentzian shape of the spectral line. And if you have this uh, uh, dipole, dipole interaction signal type, you will get a long tail on the signal continuing after kind of a decay time scale. And this long tail, it's a source of the uh, information about spectral uh, components present in the spectrum. That's allow you to go and look in the long tail uh, of the signal. And if you now uh, start to bring it back to the frequency domain, uh, if you bring two frequency components very close and you have a Lorentzian shape, they start to merge forming a broad single line. At this point, you cannot resolve any more uh, individual components. It's also related somehow to this uh, resolution problem in microscopy we have discussed. So when your points are coming very close, microscope cannot resolve them. So here it's a spectroscopy problem, but it's a similar problem. If you have a flat top of the line, you cannot resolve two lines if you are coming to the distance in a frequency domain now comparable with the line width. Uh, and if you have this apex, uh, a very sharp uh, peak, you can resolve two components, even if the lines are getting closer than the line width. And it's interesting prediction. And we can now check whether it's true. What you need to do this, you need to look at this long tail uh, of the uh, decay of the signal. Is it exponential or is it this power law? And uh, so this power law, not Lorentzian line shape, do have consequences on uh, spectral resolving power. So 
So here is an example of a spectrum recorded by NV Center, seeing this nuclear spin flowing around on the top of NV Center. And we fit now the uh, decay of the signal with two functions. One's uh, exponential on the left side, and the dots are experimental data. Um, and actually, so you immediately see that the exponential decay doesn't fit uh, very well the data. There are some components that are long tail. And uh, if you get a power law dependence, so you can uh, fit your data much better. And you also see that there, are, even though the diffusion time through the sensing volume is very short, there are components that survives uh, much longer time scale than the, uh, than the diffusion uh, time scale given values. So it's an interesting observation. It comes from the uh, particularity of the signal. So from the dipole-dipole interaction to be uh, the source uh, of the signal. And it's also, uh, it's not, a, you know, a breaking all the limits. If you are getting very close, nevertheless, it's harder to resolve, but it changes the kind of the limits of potential resolving power. So if you want to resolve components, you still need to acquire a good signal-to-noise ratio, but you can do it below the line width limit given by the diffusion time. All right, um, maybe last point <clears throat> uh, on the fundamentals I would like to discuss today in terms of sensing is the uh, dynamic range. So we have discussed the scaling of sensitivity and we want, always wanted to measure with best sensitivity possible. Uh, but often in a scenario where you uh, get the best sensitivity, you are also very limited in the dynamic range. So you can measure very tiny field change, but if your field jumps by a given uh, amount, you might lose the track on the field. So it's actually often the sensitivity and the dynamic range, the range in which you can measure the field, which as a product give you uh, a benchmark, in many scenarios. And uh, uh, so we can discuss these limitations in best scaling uh, for cases where if you want to reach a best sensitivity, or you want to keep a wide dynamic range. We again look on the evolution of the qubit uh, as a sensor. So if you basically use a qubit as a sensor, you initialize your qubit, you flip it, you measure, uh, you leave it to process, and then you measure the phase, which can result in zero and one. And you repeat it many times. Now this scenario we discussed today many, many times already. Uh, now, uh, what is the precision of this? Now you have to look on a distribution of your zero and ones. So you have noisy signal, you have to repeat your experiment many times. So, and if you do it many times with the same acquisition time, you have a noisy signal, but the width of the distribution scales as a square root of n, where n is a number of measurements. And so that's what gives you the scaling we discussed before. You can get higher precision if you repeat n measurements, but the improvement will be square root of n. Okay, but if I don't have decoherence, why I don't leave the spin to process more, more than a rotation? In this case, I can do one, two, three, four, five more rotations, and I am more sensitive. In this case, the width of the distributions uh, will be uh, actually scaling as a one over n. This is a Heisenberg scaling and sensitivity. So if you don't have decoherence and you have an unlimited time as a resource, the best you can do, you can actually get a scaling as a one hour measurement time, but you pay a price to have a very small dynamic range because you might miss the rotation. You don't know anymore after full rotation, whether it was two pi or four pi plus or six pi plus or eight pi, you are now lost in your absolute value of the, of the field. You, you can measure tiny fluctuations of the field or tiny change, but the absolute value of the field get lost for you. So this is a price to pay for high sensitivity provided that you don't have decoherence. Often you don't have a luxury to acquire for a long time because deco decoherence limits you. But in case if you do have uh, the possibility, keep in mind that you lose information about the absolute value of the field. And uh, this is a dilemma. What you want to do, you want to keep your high dynamic range 
or you want to have a higher sensitivity and often you can answer this and often it's you want to keep both and uh, there is a way to keep both actually is to make kind of adaptive measurements first i would like to gain information about where the field globally is with very low precision and then i adapt my sequence already to some existing knowledge about the field and I measure with higher and higher precision, basically combining these two approaches. With this, uh, you can actually gain back your dynamic range and try to get the sensitivity, which is uh, optimized for the highest uh, sensitivity value. So the way how uh, you can do it is kind of uh, make a complex measurement. So you start with very short Ramsey fringe, which is a very broad band uh, case and you gain a little bit of information about the field. As you see, you have our noisy data. You don't know where the field really is. And then you do one measurement, you gain a little bit better information where your field is. This is a distribution kind of a noisy uh, spectra estimation value of the field. And then you repeat these measurements again and again, every time refining. So what you need to do now, you need to run the experiments in a very fast controlled way. It's not the same sequence that you repeat. Now the next run of the experiments have to be adjusted to the previous measurements. In our case, as I have a photon or I don't have a photon. In case if I have a photon, I basically decide and also I remember all the previous results. I have to decide which uh, sequence I need to apply. It's kind of a machine learning. Uh, you get very noisy data, you get a little bit of information about very noisy signal and you run your next measurements adjusted to the previous result. And uh, so result of this, you always get better and better estimation of the field. And uh, if you would run the very last measurements without previous one, you would have uh, ambiguity. You will not know absolute value of the field, only tiny kind of change. But now you combine it, it's all the story of the measurements and all this information in total give you a combination of the wide dynamic range and high sensitivity. So it's an adaptive machine learning protocol where you run one measurements very noisy you take the measurements you update your measurement sequence do another one and you repeat it many times <clears throat> and here are results for <clears throat> uh, estimation of the different magnetic fields seen by in v center so what you plot here is uh, your estimate of the field and this uh, uh, area around is your error so you start uh, with four different fields uh, and center is a subject now of four different fields and you start with very low knowledge so you run very noisy but broadband sequence and then you improve it on the way and then it converge uh, to the uh, to the final estimate which is uh, which is uh, uh, give you a right value of the field so you you decrease your um, you decrease your error uh, and still having a high dynamic range so this combination can be very useful in case if both parameters, not only the sensitivity, but also dynamic range uh, is important. All right. Uh, now uh, let's talk more about the applications. Most of the time now we have discussed some limits, limits in sensitivity, limits in spectral resolution, uh, limits in the dynamic range but not so much real world applications was uh, shown and uh, uh, now we have a chance now actually to see where uh, this in these centers can provide actually a real advantage except that having a uh, record value on resolution or sensitivity in NMR <clears throat> but to apply it to some real open questions in chemistry, biology, and medicine. So this is now the topic of uh, next part. And I can give you some uh, example where it can be interesting to apply uh, magnetometers based on NV center. Think about uh, membrane channels where ions are flowing, where ions are flowing, there's a current flowing, there's a magnetic field that can generate a, uh, the field of a fraction of a nanotesla. Uh, neurotransmission uh, is also associated with propagation of a membrane potential and there is also a current flowing through the 
uh, axon. And so there is also magnetic fields associated with this. Uh, its value is actually hard precisely to estimate, but it expected uh, on the surface of the cell uh, to be um, up to, well, this is the early estimate, uh, was made to be 100 nanotesla. Now more precise estimate tells it maybe uh, again, a fraction of one nanotesla. And that's something also that, uh, you know, may be possible to reach uh, the sensitivity of NB center. We have seen examples where 100 nanotesla per square root of hertz was shown for a single site. So that's some, the same range. Um, biochemical processes are often um, related to catalytic uh, action of enzymes. And during these catalytic reactions, radicals are formed and those are carrying spins, electron spins, so it can be also uh, inducing uh, magnetic fields that can be measured if you interface your uh, enzyme with the, with the NV center. Um, you can think about experiments, so you of course need to interface and you can think about two types of experiments. So either you place your cells on the top of diamond with an in V center implanted or ingrown in certain depths, just a few nanometers. And now you have processes in cells or in membranes, and uh, there are channels very close uh, to in V centers where you now have this flow of ions in in V center measure fields. Or if you uh, don't like to be limited to this uh, kind of settings, or uh, you basically like cells and even communicate with each other, or be in more native environment, you can think about bringing the sensor inside of cell. And in this case, it cannot be a large diamond you can bring inside of cell, but it should be a diamond nanoparticle uh, carrying uh, color centers. So this uh, diamond nanoparticle production and uh, very localized nature of an uh, NV center, which allow um, them to be not so sensitive to the presence of the interface, is a very interesting feature. Uh, so you can now bring the quantum sensor really inside of the living cell and think about monitoring magnetic fields, but not only magnetic fields, in a very um, uh, unusual environment. Bring the qubit inside of the living cell and watch the qubit. Uh, to be a sensor. Um, so far, we have discussed the CVD and growth of diamond, and it was very exciting technique. But like for nanoparticles, often you need another type of production. You need to make a very tiny diamond powder, and that can be done by essentially making first large diamonds in large scale, and this is done by this HPHT machine and a press where you take a carbon source and convert carbon source to diamond. And then you uh, uh, crash these diamonds, uh, or sometimes you can also combine CVD uh, synthesis with production of nano diamonds, where you generate uh, particles directly in a plasma and they fall down like a snow under very special conditions of, uh, of the growth. But most of the nano diamonds so far are done by making large diamond in HPHT apparatus and then crushing them to smaller particles, you activate a native nitrogen present in these diamonds. And then from a yellowish color, you get this pinky color you have seen before. This color is now coming from the uh, presence of the color centers. And uh, so now by crushing, you can, uh, uh, and selection of smallest particles, you can get now uh, the system where you have a qubit, which you can optically address embedded in a very small particle and you have to now to interface it with biomolecule and bring it inside of cell. It's very important to be able to interface. You've seen a large diamond covered with functional group attaching protein before. Uh, you can also uh, generate a functional surface of the uh, nano diamonds using this type. It's more complex because after crashing, there are plenty of facets and every surface of diamond have different chemical properties. So if you want to generate certain groups in one facet, it's not the same treatment as you do it for the other facet. So it's kind of a pretty complex picture nevertheless. Uh, so it's possible to functionalize diamond uh, directly to make covalent bonds uh, directly on the surface, but with not 100% coverage because of this problematic of different chemical activity. You can also do a hybrid kind of device where you uh, cover uh, nano diamond with a polymer 
And now the polymer carries the functional groups. And because of this coverage can be done homogeneous, so it's more easy to interface these nanodiamonds with a, uh, with a biomolecule. You can even think about silica coating uh, of nanodiamonds where you have silicon oxide, very well established interface in biology uh, that now can be used to attach uh, molecules later. So this is example of this different functionalization and uh, actually after functionalizations, uh, the diamonds get more stable uh, because this coating can be charged and you want to avoid aggregation. So you often just after crashing, uh, diamonds are very much uh, aggregated together because of residual carbon, uh, sp2 type of, of uh, groups on the surface, hydrophobicity. And after this, uh, functionalization or even uh, coating with charged polymers, diamonds are much more dispersed, they don't aggregate, they can be actually transported in cells. So the first experiment uh, of this uh, type sensing in cells were done by Lloyd Hollenberg group some time ago. So he really left the uh, cells uh, to acquire these nanodiamonds by endocytosis and uh, then put this uh, uh, glass light with cells in a confocal microscope. Here you see the picture of a living cells where on the top there is a microwave antenna and he's looking with a confocal microscope inside of the cell. The cell contour is here, this dashed line and these bright spots here are the uh, nanodiamonds within V centers. You can now drive the uh, microwave transition as we had before but now inside of the cells, they also a little bit rotate, but each of them also have a little bit different strain inside, internal kind of strain coming from crushing. And they can, this strain can be actually used as a label. So you can always distinguish one nanodiamond from another because it has a different uh, zero field split in different inner strains that is now can be used as a label. Uh, so that's also interesting future of this. And you can also drive Rabi oscillation actually inside. It's a bit shorter coherence diamond this time was because nanodiamonds were not so perfect. They had a lot of junk still on the surface, but nevertheless, you can measure T2 and T1 time. You can do Rabi flops. And it turns out that T2 time and T1 time are both, here we show the T2 time, uh, are both affected by the cell metabolism. Actually, when cell was dying, it was observed that there is a change in the magnetic noise uh, seen by uh, NV center. And this is something that you very hardly can measure from outside. You need to be inside of cell to send this uh, biochemical uh, reactions. <clears throat> uh, nanodiamonds can also be used to detect uh, molecule and look inside of molecule if the molecule do carry magnetic ions. And one of the important molecules that carry magnetic ions is ferritin. So ferritin is a carrier of iron in our body. And uh, this iron can exist in two charge states. One of them is uh, uh, having uh, spin. Uh, and actually, uh, knowledge about the number of iron in a ferritin is having a, is having a medical significance. So there are diseases associated with uh, wrong filling of ferritin, or even in some cases, filling with wrong ions. Uh, so that's very important. This ferritin iron transport is important uh, for variety of cell signaling. So it's a very important signal process uh, carrier. And uh, so we tried actually to interface this uh, ferritin protein uh, with, uh, with a very small nanodiamonds and measure uh, magnetic ions. So they are carrying spins, they are producing magnetic field, and it can be measured uh, using in center. The way how we uh, done this uh, detection was, uh, again, a little bit to use uh, in center as antenna, but now it's not detecting alarm or precession of these ions. Uh, this will be at very high frequency, but rather flip-flops. So ions, uh, when placed very close, in a protein are continuously doing flip-flops and that's create a high frequency noise. And this noise uh, can be detected uh, by NV center to be as an antenna. And so the, uh, the state of the iron we are looking as a free, uh, iron three plus, which is uh, need to be transferred inside of the, um, inside of the ferritin. 
Now, this is a picture of the uh, nano diamonds. It's still actually larger than the ferritin molecule. So the large piece here is a nano diamond and the small uh, bulbs outside uh, a ferritin and it's an electron microscopy picture. Uh, it's pretty large nano diamond having several NB center. We, later we tried to uh, actually look for a smaller one. And we think that our detection limit was uh, very close to uh, to detection of a single ferritin, and we've been able to detect it via change of uh, coherence time and uh, T1 time of the qubit. So qubit T1 and T2 times are affected, as we have heard before, by the noise. And here the source, uh, the source of the noise is this magnetic molecule, and so we can see the distribution of the T2 time in case of uh, in case of uh, uh, nano diamonds not covered by uh, by the ferritin, this is this uh, fraction. It's a statistic and not a single measurement. We measured many many uh, nano diamonds. And in case if you attach uh, ferritin uh, molecules, the whole distribution goes to shorter time. It's a significant change. Uh, it's more than a factor of five. Uh, and the same happens for, so this is actually on the left side for T1 time, and the same happens for T2 time. So both measurements, T1 and T2, uh, is a signature or carrying the signal about uh, magnetic noise, and this protein do induce a magnetic noise, and this change actually carrying the information about the number of, uh, of iron ions inside of a uh, ferritin uh, molecule. Right, uh, so uh, when uh, talking about measurements with NV center, you often uh, think about magnetic field as a first sensing scenario. And it's a natural choice uh, of uh, sensing parameters because you have spins and spins are sensitive to magnetic fields. So here you can always be very competitive to any other system. Uh, but uh, today I would like to also highlight a little bit different measurements uh, uh, that was done with uh, NV center and other color centers. Uh, it's a measurement of temperature at nanoscale. Um, if you think about life sciences, actually measuring temperature is a key parameter. Metabolism depends on temperature. Um, temperature might play a role even in signaling in cells, and temperature effects often are poorly understood at nanoscale because there are only a few instruments and techniques that are able actually to measure temperature at nanoscale. If you think about cells, uh, there is the infrared imaging. Uh, you can bring the thermocouple inside of cell, but it's often a very disruptive or have a small colorimeter in a kind of a IFM microscope settings. Uh, these techniques are pretty precise, artifacts free, uh, but have a limited uh, resolution and uh, lead to cell damage because you try to bring something except maybe infrared, uh, which have a, a good uh, non-invasivity, but low resolution in a space. Uh, there are also other techniques based on fluorescence. Uh, fluorescence of a certain uh, proteins like GFP and other uh, derivation of it is dependent on temperature. So the most sensitive measurements of so far are done with fluorescence, measuring fluorescence lifetime, fluorescence brightness, or change in a spectrum. Uh, and this technique, we're kind of having a record value in, in terms of a, a special resolution. But um, unfortunately, fluorescence is a parameter for molecule that can be affected by many factors pH changes, that leads to change of fluorescence. Temperature changes, this lead to change in fluorescence. And now you cannot deconvolve anymore. What you observe in the cell, is it a pH change or it's a temperature change, or maybe some docking of unknown molecule to your sensor. It's uh, very hard to deconvolve all this effect. So you would like to have a calibrated temperature sensor in cell uh, that is not affected so much uh, by environment. And actually, this inability uh, to make very precise measurement with uh, 
some submicron uh, special resolution led to some very uh, actually pronounced discussions in the field. Uh, uh, there are some measurements that was uh, showing that there is a very significant uh, gradients of temperature in the cell. It might be important for a signaling and so. But then thermodynamic models uh, tells that uh, uh, basically you don't expect uh, ha to have these gradients and the difference uh, that were basically uh, predicted by models and observed were three orders of magnitude. So current measurements in nanoscale show the temperature variation that are three orders of magnitude larger than you can believe based on certain models. And so there is a very big discrepancy and it's also very important for biochemical processes to understand whether it's 3D true. And uh, so new instrument here is, uh, are very needed actually. So how you can apply a qubit to measure temperature? Well, it's not really direct measurements using a spin coherence um, because uh, when you measure the phase, it's not temperature dependent, it's depending on the magnetic field. Uh, but uh, there is a parameter in a Hamiltonian that is temperature dependent. So it's a solid state system, it's not a spin in a vacuum. And uh, we have seen uh, yesterday the wave function of NV center consisting of two electrons that spread over lattice. So the D parameter, the zero field splitting, is coming from the interaction between two electrons forming NV center. So it's dipole dipole interaction. Its trends depend how much wave function of electron overlap. If I press, say, to closer together this electron wave function, the interaction gets stronger. So the D parameter will change. And uh, this parameter, therefore, is a sign of the temperature. Uh, if the diamond lattice get compressed, you get a larger D. And so if you hit the diamond, the lattice get uh, more expanded, uh, you get a smaller D. So this parameter uh, is uh, a sign of the temperature. You remember this label on, uh, on nano diamonds, which was ready to strain. Uh, so it's also was compressing diamond in one direction. It was kind of used for labeling and recognizing the same nano diamond. The D parameter also is a function of uh, temperature. And that was actually recognized at first by our uh, next speaker, Dima Budka group. He measured the, the deep parameter and wide temperature range and have seen that there is a, a temperature dependence. So this is now temperature as yx and this is a spectral line of the uh, of the NV center and you see that here, especially around room temperature, where the lattice start to expand. So there is a strong dependence and you can actually take this uh, spectroscopic measurements and turn it uh, to be uh, a sensitive spectrometer. And actually this can go all the way up to 700 Kelvin. But uh, for life science, of course, it's around 37 degree where this is important. And here the uh, temperature dependence is quite strong. Uh, so in the uh, application settings, there were a few, yes. Mm -hmm. Now it uh, it is uh, oops. it is true that uh, optical readout can affect uh, so can basically hit uh, the nano diamonds. So there is two ways. There is a fundamental way um, of uh, limit of heating every time when an V center absorbs a photon. It's emit mostly in the phonon sideband, and there is a difference of uh, 0 0.3 V or so. So that's you dissipate in a lattice. That's hard to, with in V center, this is hard to overcome. And so this is kind of intrinsic uh, heat source, but it's not a very big dissipator. And uh, most of other heating comes from unwanted, like a graphitic impurities on the surface. That can be indeed an uh, important point. Um, and uh, so improvement of nano diamonds uh, in terms of uh, absorbing impurity in the surface is important in this field. Nevertheless, like uh, this is not the effect that are uh, under typical conditions uh, um, are very uh, dominating, especially um, in case if you can afford yourself to not uh, hit your uh, color center with a very high optical power and kind of take a bit more time for your measurements. And it's, it's, it's um, 
So this is example of applications, uh, and there were a few very interesting demonstrations from measuring inside of cells to very recently measuring effect of temperature on a cell division. And this is example uh, that was published by a looking group um, recently. It's a, a embryo uh, that is um, uh, of, uh, yeah, it's, uh, of elegance that is labeled by GFP and uh, by uh, nanodiamonds within vCenter. You see the cell and you see cell is about to divide, as an embryo about to divide. And at the same time, you have now your temperature sensor inside of the cells. And so you can measure this uh, ODMR now. This is two lines, minus one and plus one transitions. But what you're interested really about this middle point, because middle point gives you the D, and this is temperature dependence. We are not interested about shift in the magnetic field. You're looking in the center of the mass of these two lines. And the most uh, simple and precise way to measure it is to take four points so, and uh, take uh, speed of these four points and take a, a middle. So that gives you a sensitivity on the order of uh, um, 100 uh, millikelvin per square root of hertz, maybe even better a bit. And with this, you can uh, actually uh, hit also with strong infrared laser some point inside of cell, and you can measure it with very high uh, special resolution. Actually, every nano diamond is a sensor, and you can now plot them as a function of the uh, distance from the heating point, and you can see that you can measure the temperature with uh, pretty high precision, so better than the Kelvin, and you see that the, there is a kind of a decay of the heat wave from the uh, heating point to outside. So you that uh, you also can describe it in a model, you can trust your data, and it's a very calibrated sensor because it's now a D of the spin. <clears throat> so it's not affected by, uh, by any molecules outside, pH and so on. So it's a, uh, it, the effect you look is a, a lattice constant of diamond. So it might be affected by pressure, but for basically compensate your temperature dependence with pressure noise, you need very high pressure. Diamond lattice is very, very, uh, very uncompressive. So basically this temperature change in effect on, uh, on the spectral line of the NV center is a, is a very uh, self-calibrated uh, measurement device. And uh, uh, so now having this uh, at hand, uh, the next application in this field uh, would be to apply this to understand the cell cycle control. And they were already finding uh, that uh, some tiny change of temperature in the cell division affects the time that embryo takes to, to divide. Actually. And so it was not possible to measure uh, this process is with such a precision on a single cell level and understand the cell division, you know, without averaging over a very large uh, ensemble. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so this measurements I show is not, uh, it's showing the calibration. So it's a laser that it's hitting. And then there is a basically, uh, a basically equilibration from the heating point to outside. And uh, so this is a, not a natural temperature gradient, it's induced by laser. So it's a kind of for, for credit. So that's okay. But there's still a debate uh, whether this uh, one Kelvin temperature can be generated by mitochondria. And there is no answer to this because there are some measurements showing it says it is a case, and there are some models that uh, say it's not possible from just thermodynamics. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, but this is just more simple. So you hear the heat is brought from the outside. Yeah, this is heating. Yeah, this is a steady state. If you would switch off the laser, so the question is whether this kind of a gradient is stable. So if you would switch off your laser, uh, so there will be, of course, uh, like a lowering of temperature, but in a steady state. So this is, I guess, is a stable conditions. So of course, there will be a fluctuation. If there, there is a transport inside of cells, so the, the flow of, uh, of heat will be affected. 
So there are kind of a dynamical fluctuations, but overall, this is a steady state experiment. Mm -hmm. um, but this experiment saying this, I need to say that you need to send a microwave, you need to send, uh, you know, lasers better even in past way to measure more precise. And it's uh, pretty still complex. Uh, so it's not done in a standard biological microscope. And uh, there is even simple way uh, to measure temperature using color centers, a little bit less quantum again. But the emission spectrum of the color center, especially of the silicon vacancy color center, remember we discussed yesterday this one, do have a very sharp optical transition. And optical transition is affected by the lattice expansion. So if you compress your diamond, there is a, a bit of shift of the uh, zero phonon line, and this shift is about one wave number per degree. But if your line is, is sharp, so you can detect this uh, wave number shift per degree, and by taking the center of the optical emission line, you can now get the information about the temperature. So this measured data for uh, silicon vacancy heated from 15 to 30 degree about and so you can clearly see the shift directly in the spectrum. And by measuring this, you know, not in a, this way, but just with these four points, as we did before, to track the, the center mass of the line, uh, you can reach uh, the sensitivities similar to that we have seen before, on 100 uh, millikelvin uh, per, uh, per square root of hertz. Uh, and now you don't need any microwave, uh, you just... Uh, need to track the emission of your color center and so by looking at the emission line uh, change uh, you can uh, get the information about the temperature it's much more simple and uh, there are groups actually trying to apply these techniques and there are groups trying to apply this odmr based technique at the moment odmr uh, getting a uh, tracking of the spin hamiltonian is uh, a little bit more sensitive that this technique based in optical spectroscopy, but uh, simplicity of this technique is basically make it it's very interesting. In addition, they can be combined it if you basically have some doubt about uh, the, uh, the measurements on a spin system, you can also combine it with measurements in a nano diamond, having an addition silicon vacancy center. So you can uh, track multi-parameters of your color center to measure uh, temperature at uh, nanoscale. So this is to excite uh, silicon vacancy center. That's the, uh, the, the laser was uh, to, uh, yeah, to one is actually one is a heating laser and the other is uh, excitation laser, but for this color center, so the best excitation laser is a 700 one. For heating, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oops. Right, and uh, finally, if you think about nano diamond as a platform, uh, so it can be uh, not only a sensor but also a device to carry drugs and uh, be active in making uh, uh, chemical reactions activated in a cell, and then measuring effect of this. So it can be a drug carrier and the sensor in one. Uh, and this is a work of uh, Tanya Weil group where she was able to uh, take nano diamonds, functionalize with this uh, biopolymer, we discussed before is the molecules were not attached directly, but first coated with, with a polymer, and then uh, was having active molecules, like for example, drugs. And this uh, carrier can be uh, placed in cells and there can be functionality embedded in these uh, drugs. For example, some drugs start to be active when you get hit in this area. So they start to be activated and fight cancer or fight cancer cells. If these uh, particles were primarily transported inside uh, cancer cell. And uh, so that's now can be monitored by hitting uh, the drugs, monitoring its temperature and monitoring uh, cytotoxicity. And what you see here is basically uh, the 
uh, effect of the heating of cells uh, by light and the heating elements was actually uh, incorporated into a diamond platform by uh, having a polydopamine, a special kind of absorber with a drug that get activated when this absorber get hot. And this effect is happening on a few Kelvin uh, uh, scale. And uh, then you see that uh, after heating, you can also control this heating using your color centers, and then you can watch the cell cultures. Uh, the left part was uh, not heated and the right was heated and the red color here indicates uh, the, the, the non-living cells, the diet after action of the drug. So you can now monitor this process of killing cells uh, via activation of drugs by temperature and not averaging over many, many cells, but you can look on it on a single cell level and even looking inside of the cell. So this kind of a nanoscale uh, sensors can be very interesting in, uh, in this respect. All right, uh, so these were uh, applications in life sciences and still in a bulky setups. I say that some experiments uh, can be done without microwave, but it's still a microscope. And uh, uh, so it's still a kind of uh, devices or technology for basic research. Uh, there were also big interest in making diamond magnetometers uh, for uh, wide use in industry. So far, the single site experiments, nanoscale, is still very difficult to integrate. But magnetometers having many color centers are uh, most straightforward to integrate. And there are applications also of those, making uh, field measurements precise self-calibrated like atomic magnetometer, but now operating in a wide uh, range, wide dynamic range, um, operating on the ambient conditions. It can be, you know, not so much energy consuming, can be interesting for space mission. That's all uh, some area where also ensemble and V-centers magnetometers can be interesting, even for automotive industry. Uh, so there are some questions related to navigations. So if you have, don't have a GPS, your magnetic field measurements can allow your car actually to navigate or measuring the field in a brain, uh, replacing squids. That's another big, uh, uh, big uh, challenge uh, to reach in a sensitivity. And if you can do it in a user-friendly device, uh, not very high cost in some applications. So that can be very uh, important. And of course, for this, uh, it's industrial players, companies that need to uh, to step in because high degree of integration is hardly to be done uh, in uh, physics labs, maybe in engineering uh, laboratories, but also to some uh, to some to some limits. Uh, so we we see that uh, right now many industrial players are, are starting to use these techniques of in V center sensors. Um, and uh, those include uh, startup companies, but also large players uh, uh, here in, um, uh, so we have a few examples to show. There's a integrated diamond magnetometer that was developed by uh, Bosch, a company that is uh, one of the biggest players in the field of sensors. Uh, and uh, this one is now very integrated. Instead of a big optical table, you have a uh, device that is about a sugar uh, cube size. It has uh, a laser. In this case, it was uh, the LED. So you don't need a laser always. So you can use the LED if you don't need to focus it so tiny. Uh, then you have a piece of diamond within V center, an integrated lens, and it comes to the photodiet. And so this all is kind of sandwiched in the PCB, and this is a device. Uh, this first generation was not very highly sensitive, but uh, uh, so nowadays it can reach uh, sensitivities better than actually nano tester. This is a first generation device and it shows how it works. You have a zero field spectrum measured by this device and then you apply magnetic fields. So the line splits, you have a bunch of lines now. It's a bit more complex than the case I was showing before that because you have four orientations of in B centers in each of these orientation have a separate uh, splitting. Uh, actually, it can be also useful for reconstructing a vector of magnetic field. If you zoom in, 
you get this triplet. This is a hyperfine interaction with the nitrogen, the one we, we discussed in terms of uh, Q and D measurements, it now ensembles and many nuclear spins, but tracking all these lines uh, is giving you information about the magnetic fields. And now it's again, the same plot I was showing before for a single color center, it's a minimum detectable field versus average in time. And the slope gives you the sensitivity. In this case, it's 30 nanotesla per square root of Hertz. Uh, for this device, it's not a record value for magnetometer, but it's very compact. It, it's uh, a low energy consumption. It's operating in a wide uh, variety of fields. And it's already at this level can be competitive with the whole sensors. Uh, so it's uh, still, of course, more expensive. You have a piece of diamond, but this can be all, I think, handled uh, to keep the cost low. Uh, the second generation of device, it's again device produced by Bosch uh, Research Division uh, near Stuttgart. Um, it's basically fiber based, so you can more easily integrate it. And in this case, actually, the light was taken by a fiber to diamond, uh, and the detection was integrated here. And in order to uh, compensate the laser power fluctuations, there was a second detector incorporated here. And this detector was uh, tracking the fluctuation of laser power and tracking basically the allowing to compensate for this. And so right now, so you can have a better performance because the laser noise, at least part of this laser noise can be, uh, can be compensated. And uh, so in this case, the sensitivity was already much better than the, uh, the nano Tesla. So here's again, the spectral lines, the first derivative is shown. Uh, but it's essentially the same information. It's uh, now the measured field. If you apply on and off an external magnetic field over three nanotesla, I uh, know, oh, sorry, it's a precision now, which is three nanotesla for this case. So the, the field was about a few hundred nanotesla. And uh, you can also measure now precision per square root of measurement time uh, is a function of the average in time. So actually, precision is in a uh, in a pico Tesla range already, but if you measure longer and longer, first you gain in the sensitivity, but at some point you start to lose, and that's because some technical noise comes. For example, something that you cannot compensate with a laser power, or maybe your external uh, field is, if you don't shield your setup very well, it's really a bias field that changes where you operate, and that leads to this kind of uh, degradation of the sensitivity in terms of sensitivity per square root of time, not an absolute value. In absolute value, you always win, but at some point this, this curve flattens. And this is now uh, shown here as a decrease of sensitivity, but you can keep up to one second measurement time. You can keep the sensitivity well below a nano Tesla per square root of, of Hertz. And uh, the, the lab demonstrators of in V center magnetometers are orders of magnitude be or much better than, than this integrated device. And I think that Dima Budkar will show uh, more sensitive devices, but this is about the integration in a user-friendly environment, keeping the cost low, making it available for wide uh, applications area. Uh, and uh, Bosch is not the only company, it's one of the first companies try to uh, commercialize this. It's still a prototype and pilot project, uh, uh, but I think the, here the market introduction is, uh, is pretty close. Uh, oops, oh, something. The green, uh, so the, there was a, there was two detectors. So one was uh, green and the other red. So one detector, uh -huh. there's something I have, yeah. Uh, I will just get to this. Ah, yes. Ah, so this is for microwave resonator. So that's uh, 
the the microwave inlet to save energy was made like a resonator and so the, there was a microwave structure was tunable mm -hmm. all right uh, so then i think uh, um, i would like to conclude this part now we have a last part related to hyperpolarization and just would like to summarize that uh, what we have uh, as demonstrators so far using in center sensors it's very promising to apply to uh, nanoscale nuclear magnetic resonance and uh, one of the applications actually can be a, a regime where you cannot measure nmr in a normal spectrometer namely in a zero magnetic field remember that nmr spectrometer is measuring with a coil and the sensitivity of the coil is going to zero and variable frequency so in here atomic magnetometers or in these centers can be very interesting application this is the area where you cannot measure nmr spectra using conventional techniques not just because it's noisy but because it also sensitivity goes to zero and i think that dima is going to uh, talk more about this uh, so integration and advanced signal processing is another important uh, uh, basically avenue of research uh, in this field and uh, they can be combined it and maybe at some some point also this nanoscale nmr devices can be also uh, introduced it as uh, as uh, as a compact and user-friendly uh, techniques that will be available not to the physicists in their lab but to the scientists in other fields biology and chemistry and I think that's what need to come in near future. All right, and now, so I need to switch to another presentation. Ah, oh, yes, thanks. Yeah, that's good. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah i agree so uh, having a tip uh, can help you if you essentially would like to image a large molecule and with this uh, nv on under the surface you have a certain dynamic range yeah so then i agree you would uh, maybe like to scan it uh it's true uh, on the other hand uh, so producing this nv centers in a tip um, and you know, tip can um, can break, and uh, uh, you can scratch it, and a lot of uh, so the depths of NV center can can change. So they are also price to pay. But I agree. So it's uh, interesting to sometimes to basically do the same experiments in a scanning probe. Uh, sometimes it bring you a dynamic range, but otherwise, in principle, if you can bring your molecule to your NV. And if you are not interested in a very large range, but you are interested in the first couple of nanometers, then the static can be perform as good as a tip. In addition, if something happens in the interface, we are talking about life sciences, the dust particle can come. And maybe you want to take your NV out and clean it, put it in acid and recover your experiment back. So that will be very hard with a tip. So tip even sometimes changes during the day uh, and uh, so this NV center sitting on two nanometer below, that's you really can take for many months. You can clean it, take it back in experiments, find the same NV center and continue. So that's something uh, I think sometimes very useful. Uh, you can either mark it with some, uh, some, some, for example, crosses or other figures you implant with high number of NVs or other etching, for example. That's, um, it turns out that uh, because uh, this pattern of implanted NVs, it still have a little bit of individual character. You can even do it if you measure with micrometer screw in a microscope distance to the corners of the diamond. And then you, you can come to the 50 micron region. And then by just imaging this pattern of NV, you will recognize the fingerprints in the pattern. 
So often you don't need a marker. So your NV itself is a marker because there is a nearby somewhere another NV and another NV, and this pattern can be recognized pretty easily. All right. So now in the last few minutes, I just uh, would like to highlight some other applications, not at nanoscale. We have discussed at microscopic uh, sensors uh, and uh, another application related to NMR, but not in nanoscale is uh, creation of hyperpolarization. Uh, we have uh, already touched a bit the topic of uh, 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 limited sensitivity of nuclear magnetic resonance. And it was noisy detector, but also low polarization of uh, nuclear spins at room temperature. And that's basically make the MRI, which is uh, the golden standard in medical imaging technique, basically not capable to reach certain resolutions or certain sensitivity to biochemical processes. Actually, uh, non-sensitivity to single cells or non-sensitivity, not enough high sensitivity to certain concentration of molecules, uh, making it necessary to use other techniques like PET having sometimes side effects to image biochemical processes. And the standard way to increase the sensitivity uh, in NMR and MRI always make bigger magnets. So remember the thermal polarization increases with magnetic fields. So if you go from one Tesla to uh, to 10 Tesla, you will increase your signal. Actually, you will increase it even more than linear because the coil sensitivity increases with the frequency. Nevertheless, modern uh, MRI scanners are already operating in a clinical regime at seven Tesla. Uh, in uh, animal research, sometimes in 11 and higher Tesla. So there is not so much space, uh, you can do more. Uh, so the highest magnetic field you can reach in these magnets is around 20 Tesla. And this, the cost of the magnet increases enormously with the, with, the, with the field. So basically, there are some limits you can uh, touch in developing uh, stronger magnets. And other ways to increase polarization uh, is very important. So again, uh, the, uh, the limitations of uh, uh, conventional MRI is in part related to uh, limited polarization and so-called the hyperpolarization is one of the way uh, to go well beyond the limits uh, related to conventional NMR and MRI technique. So what we call a hyperpolarization. So hyperpolarization is polarization which is beyond the thermal. Uh, you can calculate the thermal polarization in certain field and if you can manage to create polarization better than it, uh, so that would be a hyperpolarization. And uh, there are ways actually how you can go beyond it, but you need some other agent, of course. Uh, just using nuclear spin, you can hardly do too much beyond the thermal polarization. You need another qubit, a very cold, low entropy spin system. And now you can bring this system close. You have very cold qubit and you have very hot nuclear spin system and you can do entropy transfer. You can take entropy from your cold, uh, or you can from a warm qubit, and then you can try to repeat this experiment many times. And with this, you can generate now better polarizations than uh, thermal state alone. Well, remember, in the beginning, we discussed the limitations of NMR for quantum computing. So it's a very different field, but in both cases, limitations are related to. Uh, deficiency of thermal states and so there are ways actually how to do it and so the standard way uh, so, so let me also show you example of how powerful it can be so if you can reach with a higher polarization uh, a better contrast uh, you can uh, you can start to see chemical reaction inside of Bose you can start to see for example a cycle of the sugar like molecules inside of body and this cycle is different for cancer cell and for a normal healthy cell and on this image you can see the peruvic acid metabolism signs in a turmoil and it's a basically picture that was made uh, by uh, uh, by MRI but not the conventional MRI, but MRI where the signal associated with nuclear spin was increased by a factor of 10,000. 
And now with the MRI machine, you can see metabolism. Usually you can't see this. And so that's why it's a very important point. It, it's not only limited to sugar cycle. This is one of the uh, most important examples, but to overall biochemistry in the body. So if you can turn MRI scanner from an imaging machine to a biochemistry resolving device that open a new perspective uh, for for variety of fields, including uh, in medicine. So how you can generate uh, non-thermal polarization of nuclear spins? So nuclear spins are unpolarized because there's very low energy gap, much smaller uh, than KT. So you cannot do too much uh, with uh, conventional uh, technique, except you can go to very low, high field and low temperature. At one Kelvin, you can polarize nuclear spins, but it's you know uh, or well below a Kelvin, very high field, but it's not really compatible with uh, uh, with uh, with the settings in MRI. You can uh, basically you will end up always in a very unpolarized state, provided that you work at room temperature and only tiny fraction of nuclear spin is active. You can think about taking electron spins, not optically active yet, and cool these electron spins to, to one Kelvin and uh, apply high magnetic fields. Then the energy separation between electron spin sublevels is now already exceeding the KT available. So you can polarize electron spins fully at very uh, low temperature, low a few Kelvin and very high magnetic fields. And this is a technique that was used before in this picture I was showing to make MRI image. So the sample was cooled. Uh, the sample with the sugar was cooled to two Kelvin, brought to high magnetic field. The radicals of electrons that were introduced in the solution uh, took the pure state, polarization was transferred, and then this sample was heated very quickly and the sugar was injected in the patient. So this is a technique that is available, the only ones uh, at the moment. And so the other way actually to uh, try to, uh, to, mod uh, to, uh, to change it is uh, to take the advantage of optical polarization. The optical photons have energy higher than uh, KT at room temperature. And if you can make a bridge between uh, optical photons and all the way to nuclear spins, so that's basically a path to, uh, to reach high nuclear spin polarization. And uh, so in V center is a natural way actually to do it because in NV centers, the uh, optical transition in scaplet to electron spin allowed to polarize electron spins even at 300 Kelvin. And then you can think about transferring polarization to nuclear spins. So that's basically the avenue that uh, potentially is possible. So how to, to polarize nuclear spins? So actually there is an energy gap between uh, nuclear spins and electron spins, they have different energy. Uh, so in case if your uh, NV center is polarized, you need to run some uh, coherent control uh, pulse sequence to transfer polarization that's done usually by applying echo techniques that were used before to detect nuclear spins. There are other variation of this technique to polarize them. And then you can actually repeat it many times and every time to repolarize and v center electron spin. Uh, because you can do it fast, a single NV center can polarize many, many nuclear spins around. And so with this, you can end up in a, in a situation where all your nuclear spins around are polarized. So this technique can have uh, two uh, variations. Uh, so it's basically uh, have advantage to work at room temperature to be non-toxic and allowed to be fast because of this optical polarization. And it has uh, two variations to operate inside and outside of diamond. But first I would like to show you very quickly the polarization transfer itself. We usually apply a Rabi drive that is tuned to be uh, resonant with the uh, Larmor precession of uh, nuclear spin of the uh, of the molecule, and then if this condition uh, is fulfilled, then the energy levels of the dress state electron spin is uh, resonant with the nuclear spin, and you can have a efficient polarization transfer. This is very well established a technique which is easy to follow, and so here the experiment. 
we have a piece of diamond and I first discuss the case where nuclear spins are still in diamond, not outside. So it's not about polarizing sugar, but it's about polarizing nuclear spins in diamond. There is 1% of carbon-13 making this complex dynamics. We have discussed it before. And now we would like to use NV center not as a qubit, but as a, as a cold low entropy spin system and transfer polarization to a nuclear spin. We first eliminate the diamond. And now this is a signal uh, of uh, electron spins in EPR spectrometer. You see very strong optical pumping because you now your electron spins are cold. And uh, this uh, cold spin system can be brought in interaction with uh, nuclear spins by this Hartman hand condition. And now nuclear spin will be uh, oriented using not a magnetic field, uh, but the, uh, the NV centers. And here's a result measured by NMR. It's not anymore this nanoscale, but it's a real NMR spectrometer. And so we had the distance between EPR where we can polarize an NMR machine. Uh, now we have them in the same room, but at this time we uh, went to, uh, to Karlsruhe where Brooker has facility. We didn't have any devices. And in Brooker, EPR and NMR divisions are a bit separate on different floors. So we had to polarize diamond in one floor and then transfer it to another floor. And this is usually a hard task for nuclear spins in many materials, they decay, but in diamonds, they're very well locked. And so we were able to polarize and, and transfer in an MR facility 100 meter away. And uh, the signal that you gain uh, is uh, evolution from a thermal, which is a blue curve. And that's actually acquired for much longer time than the one shot that we did for hyperpolarized. And that's uh, the red line. So the enhancement that we reached uh, was uh, between 50 and 100, and potentially we can reach enhancement of a few thousand. So it's not yet fully optimized. Now, what it does mean in terms of uh, data acquisition time, because you win in a signal as a square root of signal to noise as a square root of measurement time. So increasing the signal in uh, MRI by a factor of 100 means to shorten the measurement time by a factor of 10,000. That's a very significant factor. And uh, so you need 10,000 times less uh, of time to get the same sharpness of the image, or you need 100 times less substance to start to see it. So it's all very important. And here, this is a field <coughs> where you don't need orders of magnitude to have advantage. So make your picture twice sharper make your sensitivity level uh, twice better than uh, technique before was able to show. That's already bring you to a regime where you are much better and or you can bring basically really advantage to the field of uh, medicine, chemistry, biochemistry. Um, so, and uh, I think uh, I will skip a few points regarding different polarization techniques, just giving you more overview uh, where this uh, can go further. So of course, uh, polarizing bulk diamond is not super interesting in terms of biochemistry, but having this nano diamonds and uh, coating them with functional uh, groups and then bringing them into cells, injecting them in the body, that's already can be something interesting as a tracer. Uh, it's not yet about uh, detecting metabolic processes, because for this, you would need this polarization on outside molecules, not yet on diamond. But it's already can be interesting as a tracer uh, to visualize nano diamonds in MRI machines. And uh, because of this very high polarization and very long relaxation time, you might have enough time actually between injection and imaging. And uh, the signal enhancement might allow you to be much better than existing uh, techniques. You can just detect a few of these nano diamonds in a conventional MRI machine. We kind of uh, try to benchmark this uh, against existing techniques. Uh, so this is a very different medical imaging techniques that are plotted uh, with uh, two figure of merit as axis. One is molecular sensitivity and the other is special resolution. So let me explain you these benchmarks. Uh, so this molecular sensitivity means 
how much molar I can detect. So the best, uh, the best uh, technique is here on the top. Uh, and uh, so the PET, uh, positron emission tomography, and spectre variation of it, it's having a sensitivity on the order below, slightly below a picomolar. That's why you use to detect traces of metabolic activity, these techniques. It's related to detection of high energy radiation, where you put marker and so detect the, the decay. And uh, uh, on the other hand, there are other techniques which are much more friendly in terms of side effects like ultrasound or MRI or computer tomography. Uh, but MRI and ultrasound, they're user friendly, but they have very low sensitivity. Well, actually, when talking about metabolic sensitivity, I would rather only say about MRI, and they also have a low uh, special resolution usually. So actually PET is a bit better. And, and uh, so there's both numbers in terms of a special resolution and molecular sensitivity is not very good. That's why MRI is not really a molecular imaging technique, not uh, reaching golden standards. Uh, and this hyperpolarized uh, C13 MRI can bring you definitely orders of magnitude better. Using the current numbers, uh, can reach uh, uh, 10 to the minus 8 or so in molar. Uh, and so for uh, kind of, uh, if you think about antibody uh, attached to the probe, then uh, so like biomolecule attached to the probe, you can think about even detecting a, a single, uh, a single uh, nanodimer probe, and that will bring you orders of magnitude better uh, sensitivity. So this is a conventional, uh, technique you have seen before in a pyruvate, take an electron spin and transfer into a pyruvic acid that is preclinically allowed already. And there are about 20 devices uh, using this technique. And so if you use in V centers, we hope to get uh, to, uh, to, this, uh, to this regime. Showing that it's possible to bring this in a scanner, I just show you recent. Uh, results uh, that were uh, obtained it using uh, uh, MRI scanner, not NMR apparatus. And this is a collaboration with uh, Volker Asche from Ulm University Medical Center. Uh, so we are hyperpolarized now, uh, again, big piece of diamond using more advanced techniques, also sometimes uh, uh, past polarization and uh, have been able to image it inside of the scanner. So it's now not a NMR spectrometer, but it is NMR scanner. So uh, going into uh, nanodiamonds and so particles, so it, it's not meant to be uh, all living with these big pieces of diamond, need to be transferred in the body or transferred to external uh, liquid molecules. We started to optimize uh, nanodiamonds for this, again, doping with uh, NV centers starting from nitrogen containing diamond particles, this yellow uh, material to NV doped. Uh, and these particles uh, can be now actually even doped more with carbon 13 to, has more, to have more signals in some case. And NV center will be then sitting inside here of a normal material, but polarization will be transferred to this shell uh, and this shell can be used either to produce more signals uh, with a nanoparticle as a marker or to transfer polarization to external molecules using spin diffusion. This very dense uh, layer of C13 spins can be used to, uh, to transfer polarization to uh, molecules outside. And so here's a kind of a first snapshot of this very interesting tailored material. Uh, it's an uh, NMR spectra of uh, uh, core shell nanodiamonds. It's the same material in terms of uh, uh, material type, diamond in both cases, but the core having an V center uh, and the shell is made out of C13. Uh, so it's a different, is a topically different materials. And so what you see here is a very broad NMR spectrum of the shell. Uh, and that's because there's a dipole-dipole interaction between uh, carbon-13 spins. And this dipole-dipole interaction is essential now for transferring polarization to outside uh, molecule. Um, so that's basically um, what I wanted 
to tell you for today. I think I think maybe you can stop here and take some questions. Yeah. So we have five minutes for questions. Uh, are there questions? Thank you for lecture. So I'm from Stuttgart. My name is Min Shi Kwon. And then my question is the, I mean, the, uh, exactly this slide. I mean, the, uh, uh, in previous slide also the why the carbon thirteen enriched some environment give more, uh, more better some um, measurement conditions. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, uh, comparison with the twelve carbon just typical lattice crisp, uh, lattice. Um, uh, structures because in the in the distance from our MV center to the to the some environment uh, some spin bath to for example carbon thirteen or twelve twelve carbons in in these oh, cases yeah. Yeah, it is yeah. is it's a bit uh, far from uh, I mean in the same meaning is far from from it means it is a relatively weak <laughs> coupled systems and then uh -huh. And then once again, uh, I'm, little, I'm little bit some confused. So yeah, can uh -huh. you give me a more clear uh, understanding also once again. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Maybe I can repeat the question. Please correct me if I understood uh, it right. Uh, so the question is why we need to separate these fractions. Uh, why we need an V center and a center. Why carbon sitting there outside? Why do not merge it? What it bring uh, as a as a plus to have them separated because now there is a distance between uh, in v center and this carbon 13 there so it might be actually easier if you bring this all in one right yeah so the the difficulty to work with uh, 100 percent carbon 13 layer if you put in v there it will feel all these nuclear spins around straight away it will make a spectrum extremely complex and uh, this very strongly coupled nuclear spin, if I put this nuclear spin of C13 very close to NV, this is a good qubit. Remember, we had yesterday gates, but it's, uh, it's a bad polarization source because this qubit is detuned from the environment. So you can polarize the shell uh, very close, uh, but it's a little bit challenging to go farther away. And uh, so it turns to be from the model, the optimum distance so that you you leave your in v center unperturbed by this uh, nuclear spins and you polarize at some distance maybe a nanometer or two or maybe three and then from there the spin diffusion would take uh, the polarization further so this is according to our model uh, but we don't have yet uh, really experiments and models are also limited because uh, modeling dynamics of this spin diffusion in a very dense spin array, uh, the, the model itself has certain limitations. Um, we, uh, we do have control of a number of NV centers per volume. So the question is uh, how many NV centers we have here in this nano diamonds. So we, uh, we do have control by measuring that they spin in APR. So we know on average how many per, let's say, uh, per cubic nanometer we do have uh, in V centers. So this information we have. And actually the concentration is so that every uh, 10 nanometer uh, diamonds do have about one NV center. Are there more questions? Uh, yeah, maybe I can ask the last question. So uh, to, to study the, the biological processes or internal response in a cell, uh, uh, do you need large statistics to, to sort of get a, a like, uh, understanding of general nature uh, of the processes? Because uh, I would understand that, that or uh, the cell is a complex system, a uh, lot of dynamics is happening there. And then uh, if you rely on individual measurement, then it's, it's maybe changing every time because of the, uh, 
mm-hmm. cell environment and then to to get a sort of calibrated response do you need very large statistics or yeah, yeah. no absolutely i think that uh, some statistics several measurements are needed uh, it's even uh, so that some parameters are defined like time averaged uh, so i fully agree so usually for uh, also for measuring temperature you need many measurements and uh, uh, the same is true for magnetic response radical concentration this all kind of requires several measurements and if you take a, a single um, in v center uh, you also need certain measurements in order to get statistics on nv itself because once you work with a with a single quantum system you also need to average uh, to get some information about the rates that you use as a as an indicator okay yeah if if there are not uh more questions, then we can stop here. And uh, let's thank uh, Fedor once again. And maybe uh, I have a few words to say. So thank you, Fedor, formally thank you for accepting our invitation and coming here and giving these awesome lectures. And uh, yeah. We learned the physics of uh, color centers in diamonds and their applications like for magnetometry uh, to detect uh, biomolecules or uh, uh, for thermometry. And it was a nice uh, broad overview. So yeah, it was a pleasure to uh, attend these lectures. Thank you. And uh, here is a small present from VCQ. Uh, It's... Uh, it's called Imperial Torta. It's very unique to Vienna, and uh, I hope, yeah, you will like it. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll meet again at one uh, thirty uh, after lunch, and then uh, Philip Boyer, yeah, Philip Boyer will uh, give his first lecture today. <laughs>